The Edible Bean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Hensel Co-op. I'm Kelvin Hepner for Real Agriculture, and uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Anfu Hu, dry bean breeder with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here at uh, AAFC Morden. And Anfu, when it comes to dry bean breeding right now, uh, yield, of course, is always a, a priority. What are some of the other things that you see as priorities or objectives in your breeding program right now? Yeah, Kelvin, thank you. Uh, with the breeding program here, uh, yeah, you mentioned a yield. It's always our top priority. As I discussed earlier, to achieve that yield, you have to combine all those good trees together. So I emphasize so much today on disease resistance. So there are many diseases involved in this area. I talk about the three most popular disease re- diseases around here. Uh, coming bacterial blight, we call it a CBB. Anthracnose, another bad disease. It doesn't happen often, but it's really bad when it happens. So we don't want to see that. And also white mold. Sclerotunia is, is so popular uh, in a wet year especially. So we have to put, make sure we introduce the best genetics in the, in the potential varieties that we release in, in the future. And there are other diseases as well. We, we spend so much effort also on root rot. It, it's, uh, it's such a topic that you hear so often now. With the root rot, it causes significant yield losses, and there are many factors involved. So we'll try to screen large number of genetic materials uh, to try to find some reliable resistance and so that we can introduce into the breeding materials. And, and, and also we wanted to generate knowledge on the genetics of the trees. And, uh, and agronomy as well. So uh, we've been working with uh, industry like MPSG. We, we, we try to uh, look into those breeding materials, varieties, so that we release varieties with uh, uh, adaptation to the Red River Valley and also Western Manitoba. So you see some production there is going up and, and for early maturing, maturing materials uh, we put into this short season arrow trials. We conduct here, and we also put a trial a- around Malaita recently. So we all publish those data so that we, we produce those knowledge so that farmers uh, can use uh, in addition to variety uh, options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there certain types of resistance or, or uh, developments, I guess, on the horizon that you think growers should be excited about at this point right now? Yeah, we recently we re- we registered a new cranberry bean variety. Uh, it's called AEC Scotty. Uh, it, it has been granted to Cantera Seas, so they they are marketing with uh, Meridian Seas. So it's on the market. It has very good yield potential, uh, and it has been selected around this area. So it has adaptation to southern Manitoba, and it has the resistance to anthracnose. So we have the genes there. Uh, so we are. We are not that concerned in case a, a bad a pandemic of anthracnose. So that's a new variety I introduced today. And if you need to find additional information, it's on the website. And you can also reach to the company. And another variety we released earlier, many years back, it's, it was named Portage Navy Bee. That's a slight, small acreage production still here in North Dakota. It has a resistance to bacterial blight. So it's a very good, in addition to production, it's very good breeding material now. Many people are using. You can introduce that resistance to a new variety, new breeding materials. So yeah, that, that's the, the new varieties we, we re- release. And we keep working on these breeding selections so that every year we have a steady flow of breeding materials to come out. And, and in the future years, I, I mentioned to release a variety, develop a variety, it takes about 10 years. Whatever I started today, you look at it another 10 years. So many things change, but uh, yeah, we, we have to keep working on this. AFC is committed to this breeding program and with the help from MPSG, we'll work together to, to make sure we, we help the producers uh, to evaluate new breeding varieties, new breeding materials, and, and, and to help the industry. Mm-hmm. So bacterial blight, anthracnose, white mold, 
how difficult is it to find sources of resistance or how is it, is it easy? Is it just a matter of figuring out what your priorities are? Are there sources of resistance out there or how, how difficult is it in terms of actually having a supply of these, these resistant genes to, to integrate into the dry bean varieties that we grow? Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it also varies by diseases. When, when we talk about the genetics, some trees are controlled by single genes. There's one gene, you are good with it. There's one gene you control, re- atherogenous resistance, you, you introduce that gene, you are good. But there are trees like a root rot, like uh, quality trees. They are controlled by multiple genes, and they often affected by environments. So those, like white mold resistance, they are very difficult to work with. And each of those genes, they, they perform uh, by environments, they contribute, a gene contributed like 30% of resistance. So you have to accumulate multiple genes to achieve a reasonable good resistance. So it's, it's not easy. We have to work with a large number of genetic materials, work with the pathologists to do the screening and, and to find the source. And some resistance, like, like I mentioned earlier, to the CBB, bacterial blight, they are not in the domesticated bean materials, but they were found in uh, wild species. So researchers were able to introduce them into our varieties so that we can borrow and we can transfer. Now we have a very reliable resistance to bacterial blight in Western Canada in different bean types. I mentioned the pinto bean, black bean, navy bean. Yeah, we have a resistance in the field. So we, we regularly use those materials in our new uh, selections. Mm. Finally then, on food, uh, harvestability is another trait that's important for when it comes to yield at the end of the, at the, yeah. end of the crop. Yeah. Uh, what are we seeing in terms of development there? Uh, I, I guess more upright beans, is that a priority? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. When I started uh, like 15, 14 years ago, there was not that much. We, uh, producers probably still remember Pintoba. That's a very old uh, Pinto variety. It was large, late maturing, it's more bushy. And in more recent years, we started working on more upright varieties because we started a direct harvest. You save extra labor and cost. So yeah, that's a very regular focus we spend on. It also helps with uh, avoidance, I wouldn't say resistance to white mold. So you have a more upright. You, you look at all the varieties today uh, in the bean trials, they are more upright than they used to be. So there are still very bushy varieties. But uh, to, for, for direct harvest, to help with uh, the cost, managing the cost, and yeah, we pay a lot of attention uh, on this, on selecting those those upright, more upright. There are different types. In breeding, we see genetics with type one to five. One is like envoy, Etna. It's bushy type, very upright. And more f- five, you don't see in production, but in breeding, there's very climbing types. But you, we have to manage all those, but there are good trees there. But yes, in breeding today, we pay so much attention on, on, on the upright, the height as well. So they are off the ground, mm-hmm. and easy to uh, direct harvest. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks for your time and an update on your fascinating research on Vu. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs>